Finally, a high-scoring week with a lot to talk about. We have the Jets first off. Yes, this was a disaster. Yes, Brees Hall was a running back that I ranked as a top three guy coming into this season. He disappointed last week, and I went, oh, no, don't worry. He's still getting used as a receiver. He's still Brees Hall. He's still a top three player. Well, I'm sorry. Um, Brees Hall, nine carries, 23 rushing yards. Brees Hall does not save his day as a receiver here. This is very similar to what we talked about with Bijan Robinson on Thursday night, where I thought you had the safety of the receiving usage. Turned out to not be the case. Four targets for Brees out of a potential 54 Aaron Rodgers pass attempts. It's not going to get the job done. We did move Brees Hall down our rankings over on flogfantasy.com to now being a low-end RB1 rest of season rather than that penciled in high-end option. Now, good news is Braylon Allen didn't have a massive role. Braylon Allen only played 19 out of 72 snaps. Um, Going over to Garrett Wilson, it was ugly, but he got it done. Garrett Wilson, 22 targets. Yes, you had 54 Rodgers pass attempts. But still, Garrett Wilson is at the very top of the NFL in targets at this point. I think, honestly, ranking him going into the future, we had him, I believe, as the wide receiver 12 coming into the week. We probably don't move him up much because this still should be a pretty inefficient offense if you're looking at what we've had with the offensive line, this coaching staff, and Rodgers so far this season. I'm going over to the other receivers here. Alan Lazard does see 10 targets and the receiving touchdown, but it doesn't look like this is going to be a productive enough offense where you can really start anybody outside of Wilson and maybe a tight end streamer here with Tyler Conklin, who does have a decent amount of volume. Going over to Minnesota here, the box score is not going to tell the whole story. If you're just looking at the box score, it looks disgusting. 179 passing yards for Sam Darnold, but this was just an offense that they were playing for the pass interference, right? I mean, just nonstop pass interference, pass interference, pass interference on Justin Jefferson. A limited Jefferson's fantasy day in reality. He had a phenomenal real one, but still he had 15 fantasy points. So Jefferson has not had a game with fewer than 50 fantasy points this season. Um, Jordan Addison does see a decent amount of targets. He has eight targets out of 31 Sam Darnold pass attempts. So target share looks good. Addison remains as that borderline flex play dependent on matchup. And going over to what we have at the running back room, obviously at the Aaron Jones injury. We'll dive into Ty Chandler in depth with the waiver wire video coming out later this week. So just make sure you are subscribed for that. I'm going over to the Indianapolis Colts game. So no Anthony Richardson means fire up. Michael Pittman, fire up Josh Downs, the guys that you would expect to get all the volume. And actually, Pittman didn't have much. You had eight targets out of a potential 45 pass attempts here. So the market share numbers for Pittman, what you are getting a total of 20% of this offense, 20% of the targets. You actually have Josh Downs seeing the vast majority of the targets here with nine receptions, 469 receiving yards. Now, if Anthony Richardson comes back in at quarterback, None of these receivers are exciting. I understand you get the big touchdown yet again for Alec Pierce, but um, Alec Pierce is still somebody that you're not going to be able to trust with three targets out of 45 potential pass attempts. And then going over to what we had with the running backs, um, it did appear that Trey Sermon was the guy. Trey Sermon gets there with the rushing touchdown, and he has six targets out of the backfield as well. So Sermon, definitely a safe start if you have no Jonathan Taylor and you have Joe Flacco under center. Now, going over to the Jacksonville Jaguars, first off, huge shout out, Brian Thomas Jr., giving us one of the funniest pictures from the day, and also Brian Thomas Jr. on this play, actually at 22.15 miles per hour, the fastest ball carrier of the 2024 season. Um, Thomas looks phenomenal so far this season. The man has had back-to-back games with 20-plus fantasy points. And his worst game yet has been a game where you still had nine targets, five receptions, four 48 receiving yards. Locked and loaded top 24 wide receiver rest of season. Going over to the running back usage, I honestly thought, now take my L where we deserve it, that ETN was a buy low candidate and dear God, that couldn't have been more wrong. I thought that Tank Bigsby wasn't a super high priority waiver wire pickup. Dear God, that couldn't have been more wrong. Um, of course we have a lot of Tank Bigsby and underdog drafts, thank God. But besides the point, the reason I thought Bigsby wasn't going to be that appealing is you still had Dearness Johnson getting used. So it's like, okay, this, uh, three man running back by committee where ETN is the starter and Dearness Johnson still did remain with some usage here where you had 13 snaps for Johnson. You had 22 snaps for ETN and you had 23 snaps for Tank Bigsby. 
So it's still a running back by committee. Doug Peterson came out and he said that ETN is still their guy. God knows if that's true or not. Dink Bigsby looks so, so, so much better. Now, I will say Bigsby really hasn't had any usage as a receiver. I think that this may be a spot where you've had one target so far all year for Bigsby. But nonetheless, definitely a massive riser. ETN a massive faller. I'm still going to have ETN ahead of Bigsby in our rest of season rankings. But the gap between them is much, much closer. I'm going over to the Miami Dolphins. With Miami, I will reiterate, you have to keep starting Tyree Kill, even if it's gross. Tyree Kill gives you about 13 fantasy points this week. It's whatever, but you have nine targets. You have the target volume, and you really only need one big play for Tyreek to break the slate. You have a bye week for Miami next week, and then obviously two as a week closer to returning after this game as well. Um, Jalen Waddle still remains somebody you're not excited to start. Waddle gives you the 8.6 fantasy points. The issue is just not enough passing volume to go around. You have 194 passing yards. And going over to the running back room, so you have the Devon HN injury. The snap rate after this HN injury, you had 63% of the snaps going to Mostert, 36% going to Jalen Wright. That kind of carries over to their breakdown with their rush attempts and their route participation as well. Jalen Wright actually is the more efficient back here, averaging 6.6 .6 yards per carry. Jalen Wright was a capable pass catcher as well in school. Now, Jalen Wright did not log a target in this game. But we will talk about him in the waiver wire video. Obviously, we're going to need an update with this HN injury. And I do want to reiterate right now, it doesn't look like Wright's going to be like a league winning running back where HN may be back in a couple of weeks and you have a bye week this next one. Now, going over to what we have with the New England Patriots. So I benched Ramadre Stevenson in the Flock League, which, dear God, um, I'll say in the Flock League, I had a 90% chance to win. I went through, I recorded a bunch of clips, making fun of Avery, saying, oh my gosh, I'm the best, you're the worst. And now, depending on what happens in this Pittsburgh game, your boy may actually lose. What we need is we need an okay Frymuth performance, and we can't have the Pittsburgh Steelers defense dropping a ton of points, but besides the point. Here, I benched Ramondre Stevenson based off the report that you had, oh, Antonio Gibson is the starting running back, and that appears to just not matter at all. Looking at the snaps, Ramondre Stevenson does play 28 snaps compared to Antonio Gibson at 28. But Ramondre comes away with the rushing touchdown. Ramondre also gives you four cheap receptions for a full PPR format. Going into the future, if you look at this graph from PFF, and obviously all the snap data in these graphs are from PFF, you will see that Ramondre Stevenson is on a straight decline in terms of the amount of snaps that he's playing in this backfield. Antonio Gibson is still expanding his role, so... Ramadre is still a committee back and one of the worst offenses in the NFL. I'm sad to have him on my team. And we'll talk about this in the waiver wire video, but Jalen Polk is now seeing more and more work here. Well, obviously you have only one reception for 13 receiving yards, but he does draw six targets and plays a career high with this amount of snaps. Now going over to Cleveland, everybody, and I repeat, everybody is screaming for the benching of Deshaun Watson. You can't blame him. I mean, we traded Amari as soon as he had the week one performance from Watson going inefficient quarterback play equals bad wide receiver in fantasy. And yeah, Deshaun Watson has been one of, if not the most inefficient quarterbacks this year in the NFL outside of Bryce Young. Now, Stefanski does come out and say that Deshaun Watson is still the starting quarterback going into the future. But I don't know how many more weeks that we are going to expect this before you actually just have Jameis Winston in here for good. And if Winston does come in, Amari has consistently seen 30 plus percent of the targets here in Cleveland. So, I mean, he would just be an absolute smash with Jameis Winston. Now, another absolute smash is actually going to be for Monday night, where we have Chris Olave to go for more than 59 and a half receiving yards on underdog fantasy. Tough matchup against the Chiefs, but over the past three weeks, you have had 81, 86, 87 receiving yards, seeing volume at the same time. And of course, if you want to tell me that over there on Underdog, you can find the link in the description and the comment section. And if you use promo code FLOCK, you're going to get a free pick for Patrick Mahomes, more than less than half a total yard in this game. And you'll get a 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000 with code FLOCK. And on top of that, you'll get a free team review in the live stream that we are doing every single night. But let's move this over to what we have with the Washington Commanders. And I think you can say at this point that Jaden Daniels is not only one of the most impressive young quarterbacks in the NFL, but Jaden Daniels is one of the most impressive quarterbacks in the NFL, period. 
This tweet I freaking love. Jaden Daniels faced four unblocked pressures in the first half, converting all four into first downs. Two for two, 78 passing yards, two scrambles, 36 rushing yards. The man was so damn efficient coming into this week. You get the rushing production of the 82 rushing yards, making him that elite option in fantasy football. The commanders still look phenomenal. Um, Daniels was the QB four overall coming into this week for us. He may even be moving up higher than that. And then going over to Terry McLaurin, Terry McLaurin has looked better as of the last five games with Daniels. You've had a 27% team target share, 17 fantasy points per game, 84% of the routes in this offense, and then 61% of this team's air yards where he is the true alpha. And looking at the running back room, um, Eckler does have the majority of the work. I don't necessarily know how much this is going to predict going into the future in a blowout where Brian Robinson was dealing with an injury. Now, moving over to Buffalo, maybe I need to go ahead and throw in the towel and maybe we need to move Josh Allen down our quarterback rankings. Josh Allen, nine completions off of 30 pass attempts. You get the single passing touchdown to go with this. Obviously, very weird game environment here. Obviously, they do lean on a Mr. James Cook. We get saved with our underdog teams to get the Keon Coleman touchdown. Hilarious that the only thing that Keon Coleman does is score touchdowns, but you can't see volume. But yeah, if you are looking at Allen, regardless of what the excuses we want to give him, this has been a spot where you've been extremely up and down all year. You look at the production that you've had in comparison to what we are seeing with Jaden Daniels. Hard to not just move Daniels ahead of Allen because, I mean, Allen's not even running the ball as much either. You have four carries for 54 rushing yards here for Josh Allen this week. I'm um, looking at the usage for the pass catchers. It's not super predictive going into the future. Yeah, Kincaid was bad. Yeah, Keon Coleman wasn't great. But he had 131 passing yards. How many weeks do we expect there to only be 131 passing yards in Buffalo? And then obviously James Cook, top 10 running back. That hasn't changed. That won't change. He's seeing the vast majority of touches and what we expect to be a pretty damn good offense. The only thing you have to worry about is getting occasionally vultured. Now going over to the Houston Texans. First thing we'll get out of the way is with the running backs. Akers does score a rushing touchdown, but there's pretty good shot that Mixon comes back this next week, or at least hopefully he does come back. And looking at the split usage, um, Dare sees so many carries, so many snaps, where Akers only plays 22 snaps here out of potential 68. You can go ahead and you can cut Akers if he's on your team. The main thing to be following is the Nico Collins injury. Nico Collins going down obviously changes things. Where I had Stefan Diggs as the sell high candidate going into this week. I'm going to be honest with you, I was not smart enough to know that Nico Collins would get injured. And Diggs does see the eight targets. In comparison to Tank Dell with only four. In comparison to Dalton Schultz with only six. Looking at what we have with the target share post Nico Collins injury. 27% of the targets going to Diggs. 20% going to Schultz. 13% going to Dell. Diggs gets 36% of the air yards. Schultz gets 27%. Dell gets 13%. So maybe Dell isn't startable even with this injury. And obviously, Dalton Schultz does look to be a premium pickup at the tight end position, as now you have back-to-back -back games here with over 300 passing yards for C.J. Stroud. Now, we thought the Carolina Panthers offense was going to be respectable. Now, obviously, it was a very tough matchup going up against the Chicago Bears defense. I did not expect Andy Dalton to be so bad that Bryce Young comes into the game. Um, going into the future, I think base expectation is this is a bad Panthers offense again. Obviously, this was a... Um, a tough matchup to have. You also have the injury to Xavier Leggett. The injury to Leggett, maybe that rushes people to go pick up Jonathan Mingo, Jalen Coke. The reality is Deontay Johnson still dominates targets. Uh, Deontay leads this team in targets with six. Chew Bubbard still has pretty much every single touch in this backfield. Chew Bubbard gets the rushing touchdown. But all of a sudden, if this is a horrible offense and you're about to get Roshan Johnson added back in, Chuba Hubbard turns in a literal dust where you can never consider him in your starting lineup. And Deontay Johnson does not look like that locked and loaded top 24 receiver still. And maybe instead he is still a flex option because of the volume, despite him being in a horrible offense. 
Now, obviously, I have to take my L saying to sell Stefan Diggs, but the worst call was to saying to sell DJ Moore. We are worried about Caleb not having the passing volume to support the targets going to Rome, Keenan, and DJ Moore. And yeah, you do have six targets going to Rome. You have six targets going to Keenan. You have eight going to DJ Moore, but it doesn't matter. The DJ Moore revenge game, absolute blow up spot. 105 receiving yards offers two receiving touchdowns. You have two passing touchdowns here for Caleb off of the 300 passing yards. By far and away, the best game that Caleb's had all year. You get a little bit of rushing. And now I'm in a spot going, okay, I dropped the dude a couple weeks ago in my league. I have Anthony Richardson and Brock Purdy as my two quarterbacks. Am I looking to pick up Caleb? And going over to the running backs, DeAndre Swift does crush with the 21 carries, 73 rushing yards, and the rushing touchdown. But Roshan Johnson actually has usage at the goal line. Um, six snaps for DeAndre Swift, but three for Roshan. And with those three snaps, Roshan Johnson gets you two rushing touchdowns. Roshan's used primarily on third down. Roshan remains a premium handcuff back. DeAndre Swift definitely looks viable. Like I started him this week because of the matchup. And DeAndre Swift going into the future, probably still low in Darby two if you expect this Bears offense to be improved. Now going over to what we have with the Baltimore Ravens, massive spot for Lamar Jackson. Lamar has to be ahead of Josh Allen in the rest of season rankings for damn sure. We knew that there was going to be more passing volume because this game should have been closer. I was not expecting us to see a total of what? Um, a 54 Lamar Jackson dropbacks. You get the four passing touchdowns, 348 passing yards, and the 55 rushing yards. This is why Zay Flowers is more appealing this week. I mean, in these games where you have to throw the ball, Zay Flowers will be the number one target, and you do get 12 targets for Flowers. Now, of course, Bateman comes through with a touchdown. Don't pick up Bateman off the waiver wire. We'll talk about him then. Really, it's still going to be an offense that tries to run the ball every chance that they get. What's interesting is you get the 348 passing yards for Lamar Jackson. So you would assume, oh, maybe Mark Andrews, Isaiah Likely are finally saved here. That does not happen. Charlie Kolar coming out with only running six routes. The man only runs six routes. He has three receptions, 64 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown. Absolutely cucks Andrews. Now going over to the Cincinnati Bengals, it looks like, depending on how this Zach Moss injury shakes up, that Chase Brown may be winning some weeks going into the future. I mean, here, the Bengals backfield before the Zach Moss ankle injury, Moss had 75% of the snaps. Chase Brown had 25%. So Zach Moss was still being used as the majority share leader in this backfield. The Moss injury will open up Chase Brown, who's been the more efficient running back so far this year, to be a starting running back in one of the best offenses in the league. A running back at the same time that's had the usage as a receiver as well, where this week you do have three targets out of the backfield and the receiving touchdown. And clearly, um, the Cincinnati Bengals offense is back. Ooh, let me see if I can find this tweet of ours. Um, going through and saying, way back when, when people are hating on the Bengals, top five offense rest of season, buy low on everyone when you can. And yeah, this is what you, I think, have to expect going to the future. Bengals have a garbage defense. We're going to have a ton of points scored with this Cincinnati Bengals offense. Burrow absolutely crushing, 392 passing yards, the five passing touchdowns. And yeah, Chase Higgins remain must-start guys every single week going in the future. And I better, better, better win this week with the Chase blow-up game. If we waste this Chase blow-up game and we end up losing, it's going to be ugly. Of course, we'll keep you posted on the Flock League channel. But moving over to the Raiders game. We don't know who the quarterback is going into the future. Um, Gardner Minshew is bad. Aiden O'Connell's bad. It doesn't matter. Um, Brock Bowers remains a must-start option. You have no Devontae Adams. Bauer's going to see all the target volume. Was the top five tight end um, in our rankings this week. We'll remain that going into the future. Then we just had him tight end three rest of the season, maybe. I don't think we can move him any lower. Um, Jacoby Myers, still the wide receiver one here. Still not super excited about Myers based off the quarterback play. And ooh, I was, I was probably not going to be able to make this video if Trey Tucker did anything because the amount of hate we spewed towards Trey Tucker. The thing is, what we were talking about with Tucker all week, it's a bad offense, and you're the third option in that offense in the passing game. Yeah. If for whatever reason you didn't listen, you picked up Tucker, you can go ahead and drop him. And look at the running back usage. 
Alexander Madison, I thought was going to be appealing once Amir White was ruled out. Uh, Madison only has three targets, though. I was expecting a little more as a receiver. Obviously, you have the rushing touchdown for Amir Abdullah. So, I don't know. Garbage offense. Alexander Madison not seeing every touch. I think you could. Go ahead and let go. Now, going over to the Denver Broncos. Finally, a game where the Broncos were favored. You could have fired up Javante. We started him. We ended up getting the 16 fantasy points. Um, this will probably be a sell high spot if you could ever convince a sucker to buy Javante Williams from you. I'll send out some offers in my league and see if we can get anything cooking. But yeah, ultimately, the issue is this is still a very bad Broncos offense. Outside of Javante Williams, the leading receiver is Lil Jordan Humphrey. Hook'em Orange with a 48 receiving yards. God, there's no passing volume. It's a split backfield. Javante's been very inefficient all year. Nobody's appealing here. Outside of great matchups like this where you could potentially start Javante if the Broncos are favored. Now, going over to the Cardinals game. A very interesting spot, of course, where the Niners were favored by about a touchdown. Um, but James Conner gets literally every single touch in this backfield. James Conner plays 46 out of 58 potential snaps. James Conner sees all 19 carries outside of Kyler Murray with his scrambles. Now, with James Conner, we have three targets, which is maybe a little bit better than what you've had over the past few weeks. I'm still very concerned that Conner will be a running back that you're not getting consistent usage for as a receiver. But if he's going to have absolutely every touch as a rusher, it is what it is. It's interesting to see the Harrison dip here. Obviously, Marvin Harrison has given us some dud performances. He had week one with 1.4 points, 5.6 points this past week. But the target volume has been pretty consistent over the past four games where he is averaging eight targets per contest. So Harrison still must start wide receiver, still low in wide receiver one for us rest of season. Uh, Michael Wilson sees 28 out of potential 38 routes run. Wilson's going to be an every down player. I just don't know if he's going to be super consistent. Like I, I know that um, the one of the developers in the flock league went through and picked up Wilson because we play in a league where you have multiple flex spots, 12 team format during a bye with some injuries. You can throw him in if you really need him, but I don't think you can say he's much, much more than that. Now going over to the Niners would have been very tough for us to make this video. If brains and I did not show up, I was that must start name. If you were looking at the implied team totals, supposed to be the highest scoring offense in the NFL. Looking at the large sample of production that you had from Brandon Ayuk through 2023. Looking at the great matchup you had against Arizona. Clear must start spot for Ayuk. Um, obviously, blow up game. What's hilarious is this tweet from Underdog that Ayuk, eight receptions, 147 receiving yards in week five. Weeks one through four combined, 13 receptions, 167 receiving yards. So Ayuk is back. I mean, he never really changed wide receiver two in our rankings rest of season. Probably not moving him much higher. It is what it is. Um, Debo Samuel, very concerning here. Where, I mean, with Debo, you do see 52 snaps, but the, Purdy's not able to do much. Brock Purdy, you have Kittle. You have Debo. You have Ayuk. You have Jennings. We get the 244 passing yards from Purdy with multiple interceptions. Um, Jordan Mason actually all of a sudden ski sees a little bit of a scale backwards with only 41 snaps out of a potential 64. So Jordan Mason looks like he may be uh, falling back. This offense a little bit worse going in the future. I think you should be concerned about Debo a bit. Obviously, there are a lot of players in San Francisco and you're going to have these big Kittle weeks like we just saw. Now, going over to the Packers. I thought it was a clear spot to start Tucker Craft, Jaden Reed, Dontavian Wicks. Uh, Tucker Craft says, okay, who cares about the receivers? I'll take it all. What is crazy is, look at this from Next Gen Stats. Tucker Craft reached a top speed of 19.7 miles per hour on his 66-yard touchdown reception, the fastest speed by a tight end this season. Craft now leads all tight ends in yards after the catch and yards after the catch over expected this season. Kraft looks great. I believe we had him tied in eight in our rest of season rankings coming into this week. Tuck Kraft probably moves up, not just the top 10 tight end rest of season, but probably a little bit closer to the top five tight ends. Um, Dontavian Wicks and Jaden Reed both see, I mean, pretty much a career high in terms of their route participation, where Wicks plays 24 out of 29 potential routes. Jaden Reed runs 26 out of 29 potential routes. Obviously, just not nearly as much passing volume as you were expecting with only 224 passing yards for Jordan Love. And finally, the buy low candidate with Jacobs gets there. 
We finally get the rushing touchdown and the 73 rushing yards. To be honest with you, I don't love to see what we had as a receiver with only one target out of the backfield. So I'd love to come out here and dance and say, like, oh, Jacob's running back one rest of season. Um, it's a good offense. Jacob should have, I mean, 15 plus opportunities every week. So definitely a running back that's a must start guy, um, regardless of matchup. But I, I want to see a little more usage before we get too, too excited. I'm um, going over to the Rams. First thing is obviously Kyron continues to crush. I think we had Kyron ranked RB1 this week. Get the rushing touchdown, but you only have one target out of the backfield out of 45 pass attempts for Matthew Stafford. What's interesting to note here with the running back room is Blake Corum does appear to jump Ronnie Rivers for the second option. So if you wanted to go pick up Blake Corum as a premium handcuff back, you possibly could. I know we literally just said to drop the dude last week, but it is what it is. He looks like maybe he is now the guy behind Kyron. And then obviously what we said last week as well, Jordan Whittington and Tutu Atwell are the wide receiver one, wide receiver two combo. If you're holding out any hope on Demarcus Robinson, cut him. If you're holding out any hope on, um, I don't even know who the other receiver was here. Tyler Johnson, cut him. And then Jordan Whittington, you definitely could look to start him if you wanted. I'm sorry. I know we told some people in the live stream this morning to play Jalen Waddell over Whittington. I wasn't expecting us to see 45 pass attempts from Stafford. Now going over to the Giants. Um, I guess I need to put some respect on Daniel Jones's name here where I didn't know if the Giants were going to be able to pick up a single first down with no Malik neighbors. And Daniel Jones, a very strong performance up to 34 pass attempts, 257 passing yards and multiple passing touchdowns. Um, Daniel Jones actually scrambling a little bit more this week than what we have seen so far this year as well, where you get the 38 rushing yards added on. Um, Darius Slayton absolutely crushes. We'll talk about it in the waiver wire uh, video a little bit more. Um, uh, to keep it brief, don't add Slayton. Yes, this week was great. If you had him in best ball, it's cool, but it's going to be impossible to predict this going into the future, especially when Neighbors is back. And going over to the running back usage, we get a really easy split here between Tyron Tracy and Eric Gray. Tracy sees 42 snaps in comparison to Eric Gray with nine on the early downs. And Tracy sees zero snaps on third down in comparison to Eric Gray with 11 on third down. So Tracy will be the running back you want when those Singletary if the Giants are going to win the game. If the Giants are going to be playing from behind, you cannot start Tracy. So obviously in this environment where the Giants do pull up the upset over Seattle, Tracy goes out. He has 18 carries for 129 rushing yards. Um, in other instances, it's definitely not going to be as exciting. Now going over to the Seattle Seahawks, I was dancing on the grave of our opponent. I was coming out here saying, oh, Avery has no shot, blah, blah, blah. Kenneth Walker finally gets there at the end of the game with the usage as a receiver of all things where Walker, you only get 19 rushing yards and dear God, I owe y'all a massive apology here as well. I, I thought like, okay, so a spot where you're not going to have another 40 plus dropbacks from Geno Smith. Or obviously we saw that against the lions. We saw that a couple of weeks ago with the Seattle Seahawks loss as well. I thought Seattle was going to win. They were favored by almost a touchdown, but no, that doesn't happen. 44 dropbacks to Geno Smith. In comparison to seven total running back carries for Kenneth Walker and Charbonnet. So we continue to see if the Seattle Seahawks fall behind. They will abandon the run. They will air it out. Kenneth Walker gets the usage as a receiver, which you absolutely love to see. This raises both his floor and his ceiling. Um, Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, JSN, all kind of split wide receiver duties here. They all see four uh, receptions. Um, nothing changes in terms of how I'm ranking them rest of season. Uh, Tyler Lockett's barely worth the spot on your roster at the very bottom end. Desperation play if you play if you really needed him. Um, JSN in consideration for a flex spot every week. DK Metcalf as a must-start guy there at wide receiver two, but can't view him as a wide receiver one. So none of that changes. But Noah Fant does actually increase the amount of snaps that he's playing here as well. So maybe you're a little more excited about Fant. And of course, if you wanted to tell me on that underdog pick, Chris Olave higher than 59 and a half receiving yards against the Chiefs. You can find that link in the description and comment section to Underdog Fantasy. If you use promo code FLOCK, you will get a 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000. Plus, you're going to be getting a free Patrick Mahomes pick, more than less than half a total yard for Monday night. And on top of it, you'll be getting hooked up with a free team review over there on FlockFantasy.com. Just make sure you set up an account on FlockFantasy.com with the same email address as your account over there on Underdog Fantasy. That way, I know who to hook up with the free team review, but... Thank you again. I appreciate you. Really hope you have a great day and really hope I get to see you out with the video tomorrow.